afternoon, good evening, um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to UCT and to this Vice Chancellor inaugural lecture. I'm Professor Liz Lange, and I'm Acting Vice Chancellor in the absence of Dr. Price. Um, I would like to give a particular word of welcome to Professor Nkube and to her family, uh, assuming that you have your family fans here, Prof. And to my colleagues in the, in the platform, uh, to Professor Pakeng, DBC Research, to Professor Ferris, the DBC Transformation, and of course, a word of welcome to the Dean of the Faculty of Law, uh, Professor Penny Andrews. Inaugural lectures are a rite of passage in, in academic life. It is the signal of an academic achievement in a disciplinary field, and the recognitions of this achievement by the community of professors. An inaugural lecture is both a celebration and a moment of bearing witness. So all of you who are sitting here today and bearing witness to the admission, in a sense, of Professor Nkube into the professoriate. And that's a very, very important moment. The BC inaugural lecture series selects, based on faculty suggestions, those inaugural lectures that have particular potential to attract a broader audience. Hmm? So not just across faculties in the, at the university, but also we want to attract people from outside UCT. This is an occasion to showcase UCT excellence a bit more broadly. So we are very proud of the cycle of lectures. I want to thank Prof. Kube and the Faculty of Law for this lecture. And for those of you who are not familiar with the procedure, I am going to invite now Prof. Andrews to introduce Professor Nkube. Then she will give us her lecture. And at the end of the lecture, Professor Leroux will propose a vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, DVC Lange. Good evening, everybody, and welcome particularly to the family of Professor Nkubi, and congratulations. Um, Professor Nkubi was born and raised in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, and she is the first in a family of five children uh, uh, and is married and has two teenage sons. She obtained her LLB from the University of Zimbabwe. She then was awarded a joint Commonwealth uh, Fellowship Trust and Shell Centenary Scholarship to complete her LLM at the University of Cambridge. It was there that she first studied and fell in love with intellectual property law. She returned to Zimbabwe after her master's and practiced briefly with Cochlin, Welsh, and Guest. She soon decided that private practice was not for her and took up a position in the Faculty of Law at the University of Zimbabwe as a lecturer in 2002. Thereafter, she joined the School of Law at the University of the North, now called the University of Limpopo, in August 2003. In January 2005, she joined the University of Cape Town as a lecturer. She completed her doctorate part-time and has been promoted through the ranks at UCT, uh, making a full professor in 2016. Since then, she has taught and researched in company law, electronic law, and intellectual property law. Her first love, she tells me, remains intellectual property law, and this is what her lecture will be about today. She is involved in several research projects, projects uh, and with several journals. Notably, with one of our other colleagues, Professor Lee Ann Tong, she is a founding co-editor of the South African Journal of Intellectual Property Law. She has recently published a book on intellectual property and regional integration in Africa, which is very relevant after the signing of the Continental Free Trade Agreement just a few days ago on the 21st of March 2018. She has co-edited a volume on intellectual property and indigenous knowledge. She has authored more than 70 journal articles, book chapters, and conference papers. She also regularly speaks at conferences and engages with policymakers on intellectual property. 
I just recently published a chapter on transformation of legal education in South Africa, and I tried to find scholars, global scholars, who were working on the project of decolonizing law. And I'm very pleased to say that Professor Nkube is in good company with uh, internationally renowned scholars like Macau Machua, James Garty, and Tony Angie. She teaches intellectual property law at a master's level and is currently supervising 12 PhD students and three master's students. In addition to teaching, supervising, and researching, uh, Professor Kubi has served as head of department and deputy dean postgraduate studies at UCT. I asked her for one or two personal facts about herself, because when I introduce people, I like to talk a little bit about what they like. And she told me that she's an amateur runner who enjoys weekly short runs and participates in fun runs. She also enjoys a good soapy now and then in series, and sometimes she will binge watch over the weekend. Those are the two, only two, you know, personal things I could get out of her. So I was trying to figure out who would play, would, which movie actress would play her in the life story, and I thought maybe a younger Viola Davis or Lupita Nyong'o. Thank you. Prof. <laughs> Kubi. <laughs> We invite you now to deliver your inaugural lecture. Good evening. Thank you to the Dean for a gracious introduction, to the acting VC and the DVCs for being here, and to all of you for coming out. As I look across the audience, I see lots of friends, family, peers, mentors. Thank you very much all for coming to join me this evening. I'm also aware that a lot of people couldn't make it tonight and that they'll be watching the video later on or perhaps listening to a podcast. So thank you also to those who'll join us later. This evening, I'm going to reflect on the themes that have emerged in intellectual property law over the last two decades and offer a snapshot of what I've learned. I will also share the positions that I've advanced at national, global, and regional level. Many of these lessons and positions have been developed at lectures and seminars that I've led here at UCT. I will also talk about research that I'm currently engaged in and may pursue in the future. Because of the nature of this talk and the time that we have, I will not be making full legal arguments for any aspect, but will mainly raise questions and perhaps share some thoughts that I've offered in answer to those questions. For the benefit of those who'd like the full arguments, I'm going to, from time to time to project the title of my publications on those aspects. The title of this lecture is The Public Interest in Intellectual Property Law, African Solutions to Global Challenges. It raises a series of questions. For example, what is the public interest in intellectual property law? How do human rights relate to this? What are Africa's priorities and what possible solutions could we craft on the African continent? A significant portion of my work has been to unpack these concepts. But first, a quick explanation of what intellectual property is. A colloquial way of defining intellectual property is to say that it is a creation of the human mind. For example, it might be a blog post that you have written, a selfie that you've taken, a pair of running shoes, or your grandmother's famous recipe. Intellectual property is ever present in our lives and we interact with it without noticing. For example, many of us today have had several encounters with intellectual property. So I was thinking, what perhaps, what activity have we all engaged in today that I may perhaps use as an example? Well, I thought we all woke up, right? And went through some kind of routine. So let's find the intellectual property in that. I'm guessing you woke up perhaps, glanced at the newspaper, had some coffee, taken your multivitamins, brushed your teeth, had your 90 second shower, not a second longer, <laughs> dressed up before driving or catching a ride to work or wherever else you needed to be. So someone created each of those things and they would be protected by intellectual property law. I will from now on uh, refer to these things as, as works. The reason for that is that that is the language that we use in intellectual property law. The intellectual property law system is a knowledge governance system. It allocates and protects property rights in different types of forms of knowledge and its outputs. There are different types of intellectual property rights, which include copyright, trademarks, patents, and designs. They're each suited to the kind of work that they protect and have specific criteria for protection. 
So, not all creations of the human intellect are protected. Only those that meet certain criteria are protected. These rights are territorial, that is to say, they are valid only in the territory where they are granted. So each law, each country has laws that govern these rights, and when you get the right, it is only valid for that country. However, there are international agreements that set out minimum standards for protection. This is necessary to enable trade and cooperation across the world. I use the phrase human mind or intellect quite intentionally. This is because the creations of animals and technology are not protected. For example, a United States court has had to decide whether or not there is copyright in this selfie taken by a crested macaque monkey called Naruto. The story, briefly, is this. A British photographer was on expedition in Indonesia and he wanted to take some wildlife photos. So he befriended this troop of monkeys. Once they were familiar and trusted him, he set up his camera on a tripod and left the remote release cable on the ground. Eventually, a curious monkey or two crept up, grabbed the remote. Whilst looking at his reflection in the camera lens, he then took this picture. The photographer then published this picture and others online and in a book. And, would you believe it, a copyright infringement case was then brought against the photographer by some individuals and organizations representing Naruto. Right. <laughs> a US court, after hearing the arguments, decided that Naruto couldn't possibly hold copyright in the selfie because the concept of authorship is limited to human minds. Where human beings create works assisted by technology, that work <coughs> is protected by intellectual property. But where those works are created completely by technology, such as artificial intelligence, then those works are not protected. The term of protection, once you get it, is for a specific period of time. It's limited depending on the type of work that is covered. So, for example, under South African law, a patent will last for 20 years, and copyright in a photograph will last for the life of the author plus 50 years. So, if I took a selfie this morning, and I died in 2049, the copyright in that picture would last from today until 2099, 50 years after my death. The rights that I would have for the duration of the protection would include a number of things, for example, copying, adapting, importing, and selling the work. There are also other rights that are known as moral rights that may attach to the work in certain types of intellectual property protection. So, for example, I would have the right to be acknowledged as the author of the work, or to put it differently, to have the work attributed to me. The other moral right that comes into play is the right of the author to object to the distortion of the work by others. So, with this explanation in mind, let's return to that morning routine. The newspaper article you read, including any pictures and illustrations, is, co is protected by copyright. The coffee you drank might be sold under a brand that's protected by trademark. This would apply perhaps to the toothpaste you use, the outfit that you're wearing, and the vehicle that you rode in. The pharmaceutical makeup of your multivitamins or perhaps a medication that you took in the morning may be protected by patent law, as would this shower saving, the water saving shower head fitted onto your shower. The vehicle you rode in is made of parts that are protected either by patents or designs. My work makes the basic argument that these intellectual property rights must be exercised in a way that promotes societal values, promotes the public interest, and protects human rights. I believe that this is really important because as humanity, we collectively hold certain values dear and also would like our human rights protected. However, we also seek economic development, and so we grant and protect private property rights. So, I argue, it then turns on how we balance the rights of those seeking to access intellectual property rights and the work that they protect, and the rights of those who create the work that is protected by intellectual property rights. So, how do we navigate this balancing act? I think that a country should be guided by its constitution, its laws, and its policies as well as its socio-economic context. So, in that list of possible stakeholders that I think we need to give, uh, we have to give protection to and to protect their interests, I listed individuals. Industry also um, innovates, as do researchers, perhaps in publicly funded institutions such as ours. Communities also innovate, perhaps based on their indigenous knowledge. 
Each one of these types of innovators has specific intellectual property concerns that we ought to keep in mind. The core one, I think, for all of them is whether or not intellectual property law actually protects the work that they've created. To zone in, perhaps, on a couple of them, if we looked at publicly, research, publicly funded research um, institutions, perhaps a question that one might ask is, how do we best achieve the accessibility of the work that comes out of the publicly funded research institutions? If we look perhaps at the communities and the knowledge that they've created based on their indigenous knowledge, perhaps an appropriate question to ask is how the law can best protect these works. Later, I will return to each one of these types of innovators and share some research that I've undertaken on how the intellectual property law may best protect the interests of each of them. But before I get that, I want to tell you about another aspect of my work. So having looked at the right holders on the one hand, I also take time to look at those who might want to use work protected by intellectual property law. So my work is focused on answering the question, who wants to access and use works and innovations and why? Well, the answer is, is, is not complicated, but perhaps it's a long answer. The reasons for people wanting to access works and innovations are varied. They include consumption for everyday living. We want to have food to eat technology to use, and so on. Other reasons may be the pursuit of knowledge, the attainment of health, the enjoyment of culture, or it could be that you and I are perhaps innovators and we want to innovate based on existing works. And so each one of these groups of people would want to access work that's already protected by intellectual property law. The next question then that arises is how can the intellectual property system then facilitate meaningful access for each one of these groups who would like to access the work. I then argue at this point that the public interest is a very useful concept to use because I think we need to work out a fair system that will protect the creators of the works as well as the users of the works. And so I think in order to create a truly fair system that we really do need to plumb into the concept of the public interest. What do I mean by the public interest? Well, first off the bat, I must say that this concept is very contested. There are some who would argue that it's been used too often and too loosely, and therefore it has been devalued and shouldn't be used. I beg to differ. I argue that we should still use it, but what we need to do is to be very clear about what we mean by the public interest. So in my work, I have argued that the public interest for any country is what it has articulated in its constitution, in its laws, in its policies and strategies. This evening, in discussing South Africa, I will then focus on some of these, specifically intellectual property policy and law. I will speak also a bit about South Africa's national development plan, which is the primary goal of eliminating poverty and reducing inequality by 2030. Of particular relevance from the NDP are its sections on growing an inclusive economy, on improving education, training and innovation, as well as the promotion of health. The national public interest then, as I see it in South Africa, is aligned to notable international statements such as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Like South Africa's NDP, these goals address poverty, hunger, health, innovation and infrastructure. On the African continent, the African Union's Agenda 2063 also articulates similar goals. Then, for me, it is clear that eradicating poverty and improving lives are core concerns globally, continentally and nationally. That having been said, it is still important to say that each country needs to work out its own laws custom fit to its own socio-economic condition. So Africa's 50 plus countries are all at different stages of economic development. For example, 33 of them are least developed countries. And so whilst we share basic concerns and this concept of the public interest, I think that our solutions must be handcrafted or custom made to each country, depending on its goals that it is pursuing and its starting point. So my core argument is that intellectual property laws can never be a one size fits all, not globally, not continentally each country should work out its laws. However, there are international agreements that set out minimum standards, as I said earlier on, and so countries custom fit their policies and laws within the scope of those minimum agreements, standards. There are many factors that affect whether a country will achieve its socioeconomic developmental goals, and intellectual property is but one of these. So this is always important for me to remember, because once I start talking about intellectual property law, I tend to think that it is the be-all and end-all. So. 
this is a wake-up call for myself, right? So everything that I will say, I'm saying in the context of knowing that intellectual property is but one factor. It is, in my view, a very important factor, okay? One that I've devoted uh, my academic life to. There are other factors that are relevant beyond intellectual property, and these range from infrastructure, from challenges to domestic industry, to education, to training, and innovation systems. In order to have a South African intellectual property system that advances the public interest and furthers national socioeconomic goals, we need to assess the historical and current context of the system. My work therefore includes historical overviews of the receipt of intellectual property law onto African soil. It also considers how current contexts ought to inform our thinking about intellectual property policy. I argue that using the concept of the public interest will allow South Africa or any other country to custom make a suitable intellectual property law system. This approach is supported by the minimum standards international agreements that I've spoken about earlier on. For example, the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property rights that emanates from the World Trade Organization and is binding on all of its members treats countries differently based on their level of development. Transition periods were crafted into the agreement that allowed developing countries and least developed countries some space before they had to comply in full with the agreement. As I speak, the transition period for least developed countries is valid until 2021. In addition, the TRIPS agreement specifically acknowledges the public interest. It speaks about a balancing of rights to the mutual advantage of producers and users of technology. It goes on to expressly use the phrase public interest, and it mentions the public interest in reference to the promotion of health and nutrition. Once again, I'm quick to add that all of this is done within the socioeconomic context of a country whilst observing the agreed minimum standards. Earlier on, I said that the core argument that I tried to make in my work is that intellectual property rights ought to be constrained or restrained or thought of within the context of the public interest of human rights and certain societal values. I'd now like to talk about some of the rights that are relevant. These rights are based on a number of provisions that come from important binding intellectual property agreements listed on the screen. They are also inspired by certain important but non-binding declarations, including the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The basis for the protection of intellectual property right is found in Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Economic Rights. This article recognizes the rights of authors and innovators to benefit from the protection of their work materially and also from the moral rights perspective. What's really important and interesting to me from my public interest perspective is that it also recognizes the right of everyone to participate in culture as well as to benefit from scientific progress and its use. It goes on to require that states should also provide and take the necessary steps to conserve, de develop and spread science and culture. A balancing of interest then is apparent to me when I look at this article. And so once again, I like to use this article as a foundation for my claims about the public interest. Significant work has been done about what this article might mean. For example, the Special Rapporteur on the Field of Cultural Rights has released a report on copyright and the right to science and culture. Later, I'll speak about my work on these aspects. The South African con Constitution then, moving on to the national plane, protects a number of rights that are relevant to intellectual property systems. First, let's talk about the creators of works. Well, their rights are protected under Section 25 of the Constitution, which is the general property section. Under the interim Constitution, there was a specific clause providing for the protection of intellectual property rights, but this clause did not make it into the final Constitution because the Constitutional Court, in a case known as the Certification Case, said that the right to hold an intellectual property right is not a human right. This decision has been challenged by some leading scholars, but remains the law currently. The right of those wanting to use works is found in a number of different sections. For example, <coughs> Section 9's prohibition against unfair discrimination on the basis of disability can be used as the foundation for access claims for persons with disabilities. Section 16 protects the freedom of expression, which has been successfully raised as a defense to a trademark infringement case that went all the way to the Constitutional Court. Health and education are protected by sections 27 and 29 of the Constitution, and they also support claims for access to knowledge and access to medicine. 
Before I speak about these access debates, I wanted to briefly share with you some of the work that I have done that relates to innovation and intellectual property. As I said earlier, innovation occurs at various sites on the continent. It's carried out by individuals, by SMEs, by researchers, by industry, and by communities. Individuals and SMEs tend to operate in the informal sector. So my first foray into considering intellectual property matters that affect the informal sector was my doctoral thesis. This research looked at SMEs in the tourism sector in South Africa, in particular e-commerce methods that they used. I explored how intellectual property law could fairly and equitably protect the intellectual property in these e-commerce methods to make sure that the creators of them were adequately protected and remunerated whilst at the same time granting access to those who wanted to use them. It was in this project, in this work, that I started to develop my thoughts about the public interest. Soon thereafter, my thoughts about the public interest were cemented or affirmed by my, my participation in the formulation of the Washington Declaration on IP and the Public Interest, which was adopted um, in 2011, August, at a global congress. I want to speak a bit more about my engagement with um, studying IP and innovation on the continent. My next engagement that I want to speak about is my involvement in the Open African Innovation Research Project, what we, know, what we call Open AIM. From 2011 to 2014, we worked on 14 case studies in nine African countries listed on the screen. We looked at various sectors, including music, leather goods, university research, and so on. We considered various intellectual property rights, including copyrights, patents, trademarks, geographical indications, and so on. We also spent some time thinking about informal and traditional forms of knowledge governance. We found that African innovators favor collaboration, and so we argued that when they collaborate, they would be best served by an intellectual property approach that balances the protection of innovation whilst also at the same time promoting access to those innovations, and so enabling further creativity. We detailed the findings of these case studies in two publications, a book um, on the case studies and another on future scenarios. Within this project, I worked specifically on a, a case study that looked on two South African universities, considering how we can best achieve access to research coming out of them as publicly funded institutions to ensure that we meet the mandate to protect intellectual property on work coming out of the institutions, but also to make sure that knowledge is socialized. As I look across the room, I see some people that I actually had the pleasure and the honor to interview for this work. So, what was our finding? Our finding was that there is some tension between seeking intellectual property rights protection for research coming out of publicly funded institutions and actually trying to promote access to these works, but we also found that this is a tension that can be resolved to some extent where there is a commitment to actually ensuring that there is access to the works. Since 2015, open air researchers have been working on a new set of 20 case studies answering the two questions that are projected on the screen. These case studies are currently being finalized and the findings will be published soon. Now, I want to go back um, to that morning routine and to talk about how intellectual property law becomes relevant um, to the protection of indigenous knowledge. So, three possible ways in your morning routine where indigenous knowledge might have been relevant. So let's say, instead of taking your multivitamin, perhaps you took a herbal tonic for energy that is inspired by the knowledge of an indigenous community. Or a second example, let's say perhaps that the medication or the multivitamins that you took, that the active ingredient in them was actually identified and, as, and isolated based on the knowledge of a certain indigenous community. Or, as a third example, let's say your outfit, perhaps like mine, in Yembes, are actually <laughs> inspired by the traditional dress of a certain traditional community. In each of these scenarios, the question then becomes, how can we best protect indigenous knowledge? How can we ensure that the communities from whence this work is derived actually have an equitable share in the benefits that come from them? The options to protect, intellect, to protect indigenous knowledge are primarily two. The first is to try and fit it into conventional intellectual property protection, what I talk about as shoehorning, or the second, more favorable in my view, is to custom fit protection from them. 
I would say that such custom fit protection needs to be inspired by the indigenous community's own knowledge governance system, by its ideas of communal creation um, and benefit from the work that they have created. So this is a debate that has been raging for quite a while. On the African continent, I am pleased to say that we have made headway in the sense that there is a model law that was crafted by the African Union in 2000. There is also a protocol that comes out of the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization. In contrast to this progress that we have on the continent, on the global level, um, the wheels are still turning, albeit slowly. The World IP Organization has a special committee to look at this that has been meeting since 2000. And so in a period of 18 years, they've met 35 times, are yet to agree on a text. And so when I talk about global challenges and um, African solutions, I would say that this is really an area where the African continent needs to lead, perhaps because we have, I think, the best and the richest indigenous knowledge to protect. And so um, I'm grateful that we're taking the lead here. There are other important instruments that underscore the rights of indigenous communities that we need to draw on and to be aware of. The Convention on Biological Diversity and its Nagoya Protocol, as well as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I will speak a bit later about how to draw this in. I have had the, the opportunity to expand my ideas about this, primarily my idea is that we need to custom fit protection for indigenous knowledge. And so I participated in this book project that brought a lot of scholars from around the world to consider the best way to protect indigenous knowledge across the globe. We reached consensus primarily on the fact that we need to custom fit protection, although the suggestions that came from the various authors in relation to the various regions varied to some extent. A second opportunity for me to explore these ideas um, is in a volume that I co-edited in 2016. In that book, I discussed specifically South Africa's approach. So South Africa seems to be on a two-track approach to this. The first track is that Parliament chose to use the first option of using conventional intellectual property protection to protect indigenous knowledge through passing the IP Laws Amendment Act. However, this act, although it's been signed into law, has not yet come into force. Whilst it's lying on a shelf somewhere, Parliament has also started to consider custom-made um, legislation to protect intellectual property protection. This bill is currently under discussion I have had opportunity to participate in the discussions pertaining to this bill at various platforms, like speaking to parliamentary portfolio committees, to speaking um, at conferences and workshops, all speaking, all the time speaking in favor of custom-made protection. So this is a debate that continues to rage, and I hope that we'll have a solution soon in South Africa. With that in mind, I would now like to move to the access aspects of the public interest. So once again, I'm going to return to that morning routine. Um, I do hope that in the audience, there are people who remember that movie, Groundhog Day, where you had this character who woke up every morning and he went through the same routine. I'm afraid I'm gonna do that to you a bit. I'm gonna keep waking you up. I'm gonna say, you woke up this morning and you did this. Um, and so do allow me to, to do that. So back to that morning routine. You woke up this morning, after taking your multivitamins, let's say you actually had to take some chronic medication for a life-threatening but controllable condition that you have. Suppose that the pharmaceutical company that owns the patent in this medicine does not manufacture it in South Africa and has refused to give a license to a local manufacturer to make the medicine or to someone else to import the medicine and distribute it in the country. In a word, the medicine is unavailable. Suddenly, the, unavailabili the unavailability of that medicine can become a matter of life and death. It is in the public interest, I argue, and in accordance with the protection of the right to health for the law to come up with some way of meeting your need for this medicine. Intellectual property scholarship has focused for a very long time on patents and access to medicines. You will appreciate that when dealing with some diseases, such as HIV and AIDS, or some illnesses that affect mostly those of us in the global south, like TB and malaria, that this becomes a hotly contested space. I may also venture to say that perhaps it's something that moves certain sectors of, of the world more than others. Specifically, it would move those parts of the continent that are affected by these diseases more than others. 
The international agreements that set minimum standards for intellectual property protection provide some room for what we call flexibilities for countries to make their own national laws in a way that caters for the public interest in cases such as these. This has been affirmed by the Declaration on the TRIPS Agreement and Public Health. There are various flexibilities that can be used by countries, such as regulating which medicines can get patent protection, such as setting strict requirements and requiring a rigorous application process. It can also be achieved by providing exceptions to the exercise of patent rights, such as granting compulsory licenses. These compulsory licenses would then enable a local manufacturer or distributor to actually make the medicine available. An example of an African country that has done this in recent times would be Zimbabwe. In 2002, a state of emergency was declared in relation to the HIV AIDS pandemic. It was initially for six months, thereafter it was extended for five years, thereafter it was extended for another 10 years, and so is still current. What the state then has done is to issue a compulsory license to one pharmaceutical company to enable them to create, to manufacture and import ARVs. They have done this primarily for the public health sector. Other flexibilities that could be used could be relying on competition law to curb anti-competitive behavior. Finally, allowing the importation of medicines from countries where it is available is also, is also very beneficial. My work then has focused on looking at how countries, specifically South Africa, have actually used these flexibilities. I have argued there are certain things South Africa can do to strengthen its approach. For example, the country currently does not examine patent applications beyond a mere formality check. So I've argued that perhaps we need to start looking at the patent applications more formally um, and check whether they actually meet the protection requirements. I've also argued that the most appropriate way to broker the contesting interests and rights of the patent holder and those seeking access to medicines would be resorting to human rights norms. There have been several opportunities to engage with policy on these matters. Nationally, together with others, we've some submitted comments on the draft intellectual property policy of South Africa that devotes itself in the first instance in this phase to patents and public health. On the continent, I'm engaged once again with others, with the African Union's initiatives to lead on intellectual property regulation, and finally, with the Southern African Development Community's efforts to create an intellectual property rights frameworks. Globally, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to advance some of these views at the United Nations High-Level Panel on Access to Medicines at its hearings in Joburg in 2016. Well, to consider another area of intellectual property law and how the public interest might be relevant to that, let us again return to the morning routine. Let's suppose that what you read was not a newspaper, but rather a photocopy of a textbook for a course that you're taking or teaching. Copyright law regulates if and when you may make copies of someone else's protected works without getting a license from the copyright holder. In those cases where you can make a copy, the extent of the copying is also regulated. This is done through what are known as exceptions and limitations, which are public interest mechanisms that enable people to use work without taking out a license. For instance, copyright protected work may be used for purposes of private research and study under the fair dealing exception, or for purposes of teaching. These two examples are obviously linked to the right to education. You can hardly attain an education or obtain it if you do not have access to learning materials. A lot of intellectual property scholarship has focused then on looking at the exceptions and limitations and whether they are adequate to further educational, cultural or other purposes. My collaborators and I have argued that they are not adequate to meet educational and research needs. In the African Copyright and Access to Knowledge project, which looked at the laws, policies and practices of eight African countries, we asked the question whether copyright actually facilitated meaningful access to learning materials in the furtherance of education. This research project was my first experience of working in a large research project across a number of countries, and we employed empirical research methods. For a lawyer who's usually used to being bound to the desk, this was quite a stretch. For the first time, I needed to get out there, conduct interviews. Evidence gathered and analyzed during this three-year period from 2007 to 2010 by our team of about 30 researchers in these countries generated useful insights which were published both as a book and as a series of policy briefs. 
Our finding generally was that the copyright law policies and practices in these countries were suboptimal. It didn't provide enough access mechanisms, and so people were resorting to infringement in order to achieve access. Following that finding then, we urged and argued for copyright reform in all of the study countries. So, for example, when the South African Copyright Act provides for an exception for teaching purposes, the question is, what does teaching entail? Is it face-to-face -face teaching, online teaching, or distance teaching? When the Act permits using or dealing with the work fairly for certain purposes, what does fair mean? What factors do we use to determine fairness? In other work beyond this project, I've continued to write about these aspects, arguing for legislative clarity, looking at distance education and access online. I've also relied on the societal values of Ubuntu and distrib distributive justice to argue for reform. I participated in a book project where we carried out a very interesting thought experience. We sat down and said, let's imagine that we didn't have this international framework that we have, and if we wanted to craft a copyright law that is truly in the public interest, how would we frame it? In my chapter then, I argued that appropriately for the African continent, we would have recourse to values that we hold dear. So I would argue that we would think about Ubuntu, about redistributive justice, and then we would focus on areas where there was a need for the production or stimulation of production of work. The sector that I focused on is general trade publishing for children's literature in languages other than English and Afrikaans. So what I was looking at is the production of books, not for school, not prescribed school books, but just general reading for enjoyment. Um, I found that very few books are being published for this sector and began to entertain thoughts of perhaps speaking about neglected languages and neglected markets in this area. And I wondered, was copyright perhaps failing as an incentive in this instance? So in that work, I explored possible solutions to spur the production of work in, in for this sector, for this neglected sector. I suggested a number of things, including new exceptions that would permit the translation of works into local languages. In another book project, I focused on schools, libraries, and archives, and extended my thinking beyond the right to education and started to think about the rights to science and culture. Libraries and, arch and archives, I'm sure you'll agree, have a very important public interest function. They meet the community's needs to access materials for educational, entertainment, and cultural purposes. Their key challenges include um, being restrained or constrained by copyright law when they need to make copies for preservation purposes or when they want to digitize the work. And so I argued in this chapter that proceeding from a human rights perspective, we should argue for more exceptions to enable libraries and archives to fulfill this important function. More on this same theme, I'm currently participating in the African Scholars for Knowledge Justice project, which we refer to as the Us Justice project, where we're looking at the intellectual property policies of four African countries, Botswana, Kenya, South Africa, and Uganda asking questions from specifically a human rights perspective, asking to what extent lawmakers and policymakers in those countries actually think about human rights when they craft intellectual property laws. We're also asking once the laws and policies are on the table, to what extent they actually meet human rights imperatives. This work is ongoing. When it is complete, it will give more insight into these aspects from an access to knowledge and an access to medicines perspective. Let us again return to that morning routine once more. So let's say you woke up and did all of those things that I said that you did. You read your newspaper, you took a shower, you had your multivitamins. Let's say that you are blind or have a visual impairment. Then you cannot read a text version of the newspaper or book or textbook or whatever it was. You would need an accessible format of the work either in braille or audio. The making of these accessible formats includes copying of the original work and in some countries, including South Africa, in the absence of a license, would be infringing. The members of the World uh, Intellectual Property Organization in 2011 adopted a treaty known as the Marrakesh Treaty that sets out minimum exceptions and limitations that would facilitate the making of these accessible formats lawfully. South Africa has not yet ratified this treaty, but is in the process of incorporating some of its provisions into its copyright law with a view to eventually joining the treaty. The conclusion of this treaty is a notable achievement, was necessary, 
but there remains work to be done still. There are other disabilities that have not been catered for. So for example, someone with a physical disability or a cognitive or intellectual disability or an oral disability is still unable to access copyright works in the absence of a license. Over the last two years, I've been fortunate to work with a team from the University of Colorado on a study for the World Intellectual Property Organization on how copyright law may be best adjusted to start thinking about these other disabilities. Our work is starting the process of thinking about the exceptions and limitations that may be created in this regard. So just an example of the kind of transformations that we'd be thinking about here. So in the case of a visual impairment, we'd be thinking perhaps of a braille or audio version of the work. So when thinking about another disability, perhaps a cognitive or intellectual disability, what that person might need would be a version of the work in simple and plain language so they can engage with it. And so the exceptions and limitations that we're thinking about would enable the making of this work um, lawfully. So quite a lot is going on internationally with regard to copyright um, law. Fortunately, South Africa is also engaging with this. South Africa is currently reforming its Copyright Act and together with my colleagues, some of them in this room, are participating in the process um, in various ways, such as submitting <coughs> comments to Parliament, providing technical advice and presenting workshops for parliamentarians. Against the background of what I've said about the public interest, how it relates to the creators of works and how it's implicated in access debates, I now want to move on in the last few minutes to talk about intellectual property in Africa. So I've already mentioned in speaking to you earlier on that each country has its laws, so there's regulation at the national level. I've repeatedly spoken about regulation at the international level from the perspective of minimum standards. And so I want to now zone in on the middle layer, and that is the continental level, what you may refer to as the sub-regional or regional level. On the African continent, arrangements for intellectual property regulation center around two intellectual property organizations and the 12 regional economic communities that we have. As the Dean mentioned earlier on, um, last week on the 21st of March, the Continental Free Trade Agreement was signed. So the, the vision for the regional economic communities is that in the long term, they would integrate or merge into the continent of free trade area. And so there's quite a lot of activity on this plane um, with the regional economic communities actually engaging with intellectual property um, regulation. Several of these already have intellectual property frameworks and others do not. Those that do not have these frameworks are currently working on these frameworks. My work at this level has focused on, us, on assessing whether there's policy alignment on these two levels, and also studying the nature of the institutional arrangements that we have on the African continent. An interesting development has been the African Union's creation of a pan-African intellectual property organization. The prudence of this from a policy and resource perspective has been questioned. The statute, however, has been adopted but has not yet come into force because not enough countries have signed on. 15 countries are required to ratify the treaty before it comes into, for into force. At last count, yesterday, only three countries had yet signed to it. I've also considered intellectual property policies of African states and documented these and other findings in a book on IP policy, law and administration published in 2006. My work on IP from a continental perspective has continued through radio discussions, the Afro-IP blog and other blogs, the South African Intellectual Property Law Journal that the Dean referred to, which I co-edited with Professor Lee Tong, and the African Journal of Intellectual Property, on whose editorial board I sit. From an institutional technical advice perspective, I'm involved in the preparation of an intellectual property rights framework for the Southern African Development Co Community with other collaborators. We're also engaged in the African Union's preparations for an intellectual property agreement within the context of the Continental Free Trade Agreement. In this regard, a working paper we prepared has fed into an AU paper that was published in 2017, speaking about regional integration and specifically about bringing the, continen the Continental Free Trade area into being. To sum it all up then, my work, whilst proceeding from a number of perspectives, has really centered on the baseline argument that intellectual property rights, whether nationally, regionally, or globally, must be driven by public interest concerns, it must be informed by societal values, and it must protect human rights. 
How one approaches this would of course be within the socio-economic context of the country concerned. I hope that some of the thoughts that are flighted this evening about how this might work out from a value perspective, from a human rights perspective, may indeed stay with you. And hopefully tomorrow when you wake up, you'll remember me <laughs> and my various examples of what happens when you wake up. I hope you will continue to spare intellectual property and the public interest some thoughts. Professor LaRue is going to come up and give um, the vote of thanks shortly, but I want to sneak in a few words of thanks <coughs> before that. I've been blessed to be a member of several projects and networks through which I formed lifelong friendships and hopefully got some sound academic skills and knowledge. The opportunity to work with historians, economists, librarians, innovation scholars, and other subject specialists from all over the world has been mind-bending, to say the least. Being dragged out of my office to conduct interviews has been, for a lawyer, a desk-bound lawyer, quite uh, a learning curve. I would like to thank all of my collaborators and friends in these networks for their support and friendship and for inspiring me with their work. My future work will continue to orbit around these networks. In many cases, as I shared earlier, we are still working on projects. Tonight in London, in about two hours' time, a new network on intellectual property and intangible cultural heritage will be launched. So I'd like to mark that important occasion. If I wasn't here, I'd be there. I'd like to wish my collaborators well for the event and to promise you that together we'll be commencing exciting work, which I hope to have the opportunity to share with you in the future. It's always nice to play in one's own corner as well. So I owe immense gratitude to my friends and colleagues on the International and South African Associations for Teaching and Research in Intellectual Property and Information Technology Room. Once again, many of my thoughts and ideas have been flighted before them at workshops and conferences. Special thanks are due to the law faculty IP cohort, namely Leanne Tong, Tobias Sean Vetter, Debbie Collier before she dumped us, <laughs> the members of the IP unit, and all research students. <laughs> she didn't dump us, she says. <laughs> no, she didn't. Um, to research students, past and present, whom it has been a pleasure to work with. I would also like to thank colleagues from across the university with whom I've worked, from the research office, from the libraries, from CHED, the humanities faculty. It has been a singular honor to work with all of you. It's also been great to work with law faculty colleagues during weekdays and to run with some of them over the weekends. To my family and friends, mentors, peers, students, Nyawonga, and of course, thank you very much to all of you for sparing your time to attend this lecture. Good evening. Thank you very much, Professor Nkube. Your students are really very lucky. So, Prof. Leroux, it's your turn to do the vote of thanks, please. Caroline, let me say, start by saying what a tremendous honor it is for me as a long-standing colleague, but also as your current head of department, to present the vote of thanks on the, on the occasion of your inaugural. As Professor Langer pointed out earlier, the word inaugural means to mark the beginning of an era or a, or a position, and in the case of an academic, it signifies acceptance into the deepest fold of the academy. But while it suggests the start of a new era, an academic inaugural also serves to celebrate what has gone before. I was a member of the panel that interviewed you for the position of lectureship in the department in 2004. I still have a very clear recollection of the presentation you were required to do as part of the interviewing process. Clearly and confidently, but certainly not arrogantly, you presented a topic dealing with the intrigues of corporations. And long before your interview was done, I knew that you were a special person and a great talent, and that I, to slightly misquote our colleague Professor Evans Kalula, was present at the beginning of something special. 
It was with great pleasure and pride that I followed the steadfast progression of your career to where you are tonight. Perhaps wiser and a touch older, but as we have seen tonight, the clarity of thought and quiet confidence survived the onslaught of the intervening years, three of them as head of department and one as deputy dean. And to crown it all, the scholarly promise, already evident during the interview in 2004, has now come to fruition in a way that I can only envy and applaud. Having listened to your insights tonight, I cannot help but to again have a sense that I'm present at the start of something special. Yes, I have no doubt that your academic career will continue to propel forwards to significant heights. But this time, I see the image of a scholar taking us to a full understanding of the potential and opportunities offered by this continent. Thank you for your insights that you've shared with us this evening. And on behalf of our department, the faculty, the university, and the greater community of scientists, I wish you strength for this next very important leg of your scholarly journey. It is not going to be easy, but we need you to succeed. Acting Vice Chancellor, I promised Caroline that I would end with a riddle. <laughs> Caroline, the hour has come. It is the age of Albukalan. Tonight, the mother of mankind has appointed you as one of her spokespersons. However, for the moment, you are entitled to celebrate what has gone before, and we gladly join you in the celebrations. Well done. Thank you very much. Evidently, tonight is a display of the talent in the Faculty of Law. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming tonight and enjoy with us this, this lecture. Uh, thank you for the family. I hope that you are very, very proud, you young people. And um, please join us in the foyer to congratulate Professor Caroline and, and her family. Thank you very much. <laughs>